If you have your Bibles with you, I'd ask to turn to Colossians. Colossians chapter 3 is where we'll take our uh, thoughts and prayers to this evening. Colossians chapter 3. And we're going to begin reading in the very first verse. Colossians chapter 3. In the first verse, the Bible says, If ye then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ sitteth at the right hand of God. Set your affection on things above, and not on things on the earth. For ye are dead, and your life is hid with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then shall you also appear with him in glory. Dear Lord, we thank you and we praise you for your goodness and watch care. Lord, we thank you for the little church here at Dover and that in the day that we live that you would allow us to stand and that we would become stronger in your word. That is what is needed, that we'd be strong in your word and not in the ideas of men, that we'd understand this book like we never have before. Uh, we pray for a hedge of protection around this place because we know that the devil's character is to get in and create problem where there is none. And we pray that you protect us from that tonight, Lord. Uh, we pray for those that are out, Lord, that you would be with them, that you would give them traveling mercies. And we pray these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. Now, we'll be um, preaching this evening on uh, thinking about what's up there. Uh, we find here that Paul gives the church at Colossus the advice to set their, uh, set their uh, attention, set their affection on things above. And I think to set your affection, you have to know what's up there. Uh, it's hard to set your affection on something that you don't know about. And if we get into this blessed old book, we can know a lot about what's up there. Uh, we can understand uh, how, how majestic and how beautiful and how wonderful heaven must be. And, and, and we can really begin to, to ponder and to think about what the Lord has in store for us when we leave here. So uh, Paul writing to the church of Colossus and uh, he's really starting to end their letter. He says, he, he reminds them and re re remember he is writing to a church, supposedly a group of saved folks. And he makes this statement, if you be risen with Christ. And that's why just because you attend regularly and just maybe because you had an emotional experience does not place you among the redeemed. Right. And so all through the, the, all the church letters, Paul says again and again, if you're there, mm -hmm. if you know. Peter says, make your calling and election sure. And, and, and different ways that, that it's presented in the scripture down through the, uh, down through the church years, again and again, they are encouraged to look at that. And the reason we are encouraged to look at our redemption, uh, maybe by the help of the Holy Ghost, we'll see, well, maybe it's not like it should be, or better still, that sweet presence when he encourages you and says, yeah, you're mine. And you belong to me. And so Paul makes this statement to the believers at Colossus and, and says, if you're there, if you be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above. Now that is a lot of things. First of all, uh, seek means active. Seek shows action. It's a verb. And it tells so we need to know how to do that, do we not? If you're commanded or requested to do something, the need would be, how do I accomplish this? How do I get it done? How do I seek things that are up there? Now, I certainly don't think that's talking about the, the heaven above us, the clouds and the wind, and I don't think it's talking about the astrology above us, the universe. I think it's specifically saying, seek the things of God. Look, and not just that, have you ever considered heaven? 
You know, when I was a kid, we used to sing that song, How Beautiful Heaven Must Be. And, and you know, as a boy just singing, you kind of just say the words. But as I grow older and see the reality that the end of my days, probably within 20 or 30 years, I'll be done. And I began to think how wonderful that place is going to be. And so when we can get in there and, and read about the, and I know that John just wrote what he could describe it by, but can you imagine to be again feasting on the things that are above? I know this, that this body will no longer be uh, turned towards sin. That, that's amazing to me. Uh, I know that the sights are incredible there. And, and I think the thing that's most satisfying to me is the thought to be at the feet of Jesus throughout the ceaseless ages. That's amazing to me. That's a wonderful, wonderful uh, console to my soul is the knowing that uh, what is ahead. But you know what? I believe always I can know more. Yeah. Always I can look deeper and think about what's above and what's up there with the Almighty. If ye then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above. Now, a, a, a sub-benefit to that, and I know I get so caught up in the world myself, but the, the, the benefit of seeking things above, you don't have to get into this mess down here. Uh, we spend way too much time worrying about things we can't do anything about. Yeah, that's it. And you know what? That, that's concentrating down on uh, things down here. You know what? They, if we believe in God's sovereignty, and the older I get, the more that I, I believe I understand it, if I'm going to get COVID, I'm going to get COVID, and it's the very will of God. So how could you argue with that? How, how, how could you put that... Uh, behind, how could you say, oh, that's horrible? No, no, all things work together for good to them that love the Lord, to those that are called according to His purpose. Amen. And so it has to be good. It, it has to be a good thing. And, and so we find, as Paul is writing here, that there is a twofold benefit and get our mind off this mess and get our mind on that which is above. And he says, that's where you need to be. Verse 2, set your affection. Now, I understand affection is like love, attention, giving, giving people the, uh, the uh, center of things. Now, um, when me and Donna were dating, I tried to keep her at the center. Now, as all married couples know, when the children start coming along and they require your attention and, and you've got a career and you've got work and everything's going on, it's harder and harder to do that. that. But certainly we should. And above that, it's even harder to set our affection, our love, our interest to what's above. Set your affections on things which are above. Look unto that. What is above? Well, we know the Almighty Jehovah is above. We know the Lord Jesus Christ is sitting at His right hand. That's what I need to set my affection on. Uh, we know that it's a sinless paradise where sin is not allowed. That in and of itself is an amazing, amazing thing to me. That to abide in a place where sin doesn't exist. That, that is beyond my comprehension. Yeah. But yet and still, I know that it will be just that way. And, and so he, he commands something of us to seek and to set. Now, I don't believe the Lord God, the Lord Jesus Christ, ever inspired a writer to ask something that wasn't possible. Right. If, if they ask it, and that would be seek and set, then we must be capable. Or otherwise he would not. Now I will say this, and certainly it is so, it's not an easy task to accomplish. It's not, it's not something that, that, that comes good to the flesh with all the interruptions that are around us, but it is a possibility. Notice he gives us one of the helpers, if you will, one of the aids that we have for your dead. What, what do we did too? Uh, this this stuff you're looking at tonight is supposed to be dead. Now, a dead thing 
don't get in the way, does it? Now, if we have a varmint and our cats, man, they're good mousers and they get birds and all kinds of varmints and they throw them up on the porch for dying. You know what? Every time one of us, and it's usually me or Donna, we glove up, and, and when I was a kid, we didn't have gloves. She just had to go get it and throw it out. But we glove up, and we get the barn mat, and we throw it down the hillside. Uh, and you know what? Those birds, and those squirrels, and those weird varmints can't get up and move themselves, can they? So if we're dead, we can get, we'll get this flesh out of the way. Now listen, you're never going to conquer it all together. But my dear friend, don't use that as excuse. And I think often we do. And, and, and say, oh, that's just my flesh. Well, yeah, it is, but uh, it's dead, or it's supposed to be dead. And the spirit man on the inside is the one that's supposed to be reigning. So he says, this is going to be a benefit. This is a help. This is dead, or it ought to be dead. For you are dead and your life is hid with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life. Now you think about that. That's, a, that's an unbelievable statement. Is Christ our life? You know, the Bible says the church in Antioch, they were called Christians first at Antioch. Now, you know what? I have to believe that their life was Christ. The reason they got that tag, the reason they got that branded upon them was they were so much like Christ it popped out on like chicken bones. And they understood and knew the character of Christ. See, we can do that if we do those first things. Set, set yourself, set your mind on things above. Get in uh, a mode of asking yourself, what would Christ do? And if, if you get that, then certainly do it. So we get two commands here, and certainly it's to seek and to set, and we get the benefits, and we have a very clear statement that it is possible, and that ought to be where we go. Now go with me to the Gospel of John, and we're going to look at a couple of things. Uh, the Lord being our helper tonight, what is there? Where is our focus up there? Uh, what are we to look at? Uh, the Gospel of John chapter 3. The Gospel of John chapter 3. And we're going to begin reading in verse 20, uh, 27. Uh, John chapter 3, verse 27. John meaning John the Baptist. And John answered and said, A man can receive nothing except it be given from heaven. Now again... Later on, Peter the Apostle, he really said the same thing. Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And the Lord Jesus said, Blessed are thou, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood have not it revealed it unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. And here we have a very singular statement, a very singular, and John answered John the Baptist, A man cannot can receive nothing except it be given him of the Father. So the next time you're out witnessing and they look like a blank slave, just remember it's not been given of God. And tell them you love them and you pray for them and go on. That is literally the only thing we can do. And, and, and so we see that John the Baptist very clearly understood uh, the workings of the Almighty in regeneration. He understood that to a T. Verse 28, uh, ye yourselves bear me witness that I said, I am not the Christ, but I am sent before him. He reminds them that I said I was a forerunner. I'm not Jesus, I'm not Christ, but I'm his forerunner. Verse 29, he that hath the bride is the bridegroom. But the friend of the bridegroom, which standeth and heareth him, rejoice, rejoiceth greatly because of the bridegroom's voice. This my joy, therefore, is fulfilled. In other words, he heard Christ speak. And he says, my joy is fulfilled. My witness is done. He must increase, but I must decrease. He that cometh from above is above all. Now, there's some good writers out there, and, and I enjoy writing. And 
I, I enjoy reading after them. But remember this, uh, none of those historic writers are Christ. Not even Spurgeon. We have the entire works of Spurgeon right back here. Good books help you understand the scripture a little better. But remember, none of those commentaries is Christ. Right. He is above all. And I don't care how wonderful a preacher is, he is not above Christ. And uh, everybody knows in here tonight that probably my, my father in the faith, if you want to call it, was Brother Gordon Downs on whom would to be the Lord now. But you know what? He's not Christ. There's, there's one far above it. Yeah. And, and, and so we, we need to remember that when we're studying the Word. And so John the Baptist makes it very, very clear he is at the top. So what's above? What's up there? The Lord Jesus Christ. He's sitting at the right hand of the Father. And when people... Uh, come home, especially when they come home and they've done great, a great and wonderful job, he stands up and is ready to greet them. You remember, Stephen says, I see the Son of God standing at the right hand of the Father. And he was, re and he was ready, and I have no doubt, when Stephen went up, he ran and hugged him and said, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. See, he is above. So whatever man may say, if it's not in that book, you go with what's above. And you know what? I found this down through the years. A lot of men, what, what men say sounds good, but it's just not in the Bible. And so we, as the Lord's people, we, we must focus on exactly what the Scriptures teach and not simply make inferences for ourselves. And so... Uh, then John says, he, come, he that cometh from above is above all. He that is of the earth is earthly and speaketh of the earth. He that cometh from heaven is above all. Now, I just want to interject very quickly. He that is of the earth is earthly. Right. Now, uh, the big deal for many, many religions is the Pope. Well, Everybody that's listening, if you're Catholic, I want you to get this. He is of the earth. That's right. You may think he's better than sliced bread, but let me remind you, he is of the earth. He is not, he is not a substitute for Christ. He is not a mediator between you and Christ. He is an earthly man. Mm -hmm. And so the Lord Jesus Christ... Uh, <laughs> the inspired John and John said very plainly he's at the top of the list he's doing the work and everything down here all the religions that's left is just earthly that's all it is is uh, it is just what man can come up with and so certainly we are to avoid that Ephesians Paul writing to the church at Ephesus he uh, gives them a little bit of insight to watch above. Ephesians chapter 3 and verse 20. Ephesians chapter 3 and verse 20, the Bible says this, and are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone, in whom all the building fitly framed together groweth into an holy temple unto, in the Lord, in whom ye also, in whom, in whom ye also are builded together for the habitation of God through the Spirit. So I want you to see that uh, the very foundation of what is above is the Lord Jesus Christ. He is the foundation. He is our mediator. He goes between us and man. And so whatever man may say, you just remember that Christ preempts it all. And if Christ says something contrary to it, uh, for example, whatever doctrine you want to pick out, pick out if, Christ, if Christ is not in that, then something's wrong. And so... Uh, it says here he's our mediator. Christ is above. A mediator is a defense attorney. Uh, a mediator is one that goes before you in the court. Uh, 
Uh, a mediator is, is someone that presents your case. And you think about yourself and how vile and ungodly that you really are. And what is your possible hope but leaning on the Lord Jesus Christ? That is your only defense when it comes to self, the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so we find another thing that's up there, the Lord Jesus Christ, and He is our mediator. He goes between us and God and defends us greatly. Uh, Philippians, Philippians chapter 2, Philippians chapter 2 and verse 8. Um, uh, Philippians chapter 2 and verse 8, the Bible says, And being fashioned as, as a man, meaning the Lord Jesus Christ, and being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Now, I want you to see that this mighty intercessor, the Lord Jesus Christ, it said that he became obedient to death. In other words, he didn't have to die. He yielded himself to that. And if you read the uh, crucifixion as documented by Matthew and Luke, it literally says he gave up the ghost. They didn't rip it from him. They didn't pound his life out, although they tried. They didn't rip him one side to down the other and to result in his death. He yielded up the ghost. That was, that was his sacrifice. To taste death, the very God of heaven tasting death on our behalf. Uh, if you really get into that, that's more than you can fathom. Uh, that, that, that's more than you can uh, put your mind around. And, and so we see what a great intervention this was for us as the Lord's people. Verse 9, Wherefore God also hath highly exalted him. Um, the Lord God, the Lord God Jehovah exalted him because he completed the work. Because he became the intercessor. He was lifted up and raised up even higher than he was before. Wherefore God also hath highly exalted him and given him and given him a name which is above every name. You know what? I, I've seen this when people go in the seventh day direction and, uh, and, and, and that mess, they always have to be little Christ to get there. You know what that is? That's a smack in the face of the Almighty. Yeah. It really is. You know what? You can say what you want to about me, but don't mess with my youngest. Right? And the oldest one is 31 now. And that goes from him all the way down to Bella. Even they're grown, don't mess with my kids. Right? And so uh, I certainly believe the Lord God the Almighty had the same... Uh, the same uh, uh, love for his son as even we do, much more pure and much more better. And he says, because of what he done, he submitted himself, he'll be highly exalted. Verse 10, that at the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow of things in heaven and things of earth and things under the earth. Now, I want you to notice the description of what's going to bow to Christ. First of all, every knee. Every knee that ever existed. They will bow and say, yes, you are the Almighty. Can you, uh, can you imagine when Madame Miller, Marilyn O'Hare has to get down and say, thou art God. And he'll say, depart from me, the work of iniquity I've never made. But she'll do it. Uh, every hardcore atheist will say, yes, you are him. Uh, yeah. <clears throat> There's a sign on the interstate at I-40 down at Dixon. That's 50 miles from here. It says, here's the good news. There is no God. Mm. That is the most blasphemous thing. And you're talking about here in the Bible Belt. See, see, Daddy's becoming the... Con but you know what? I don't know who put her up, and I don't know who wrote that phrase, but one day we will. And, and, and those ungodly people will say, Thou art God. 
Thou art the Christ. And then again, uh, even though they're finally praising him, he'll say, depart from me, you worker of iniquity, I never knew you. So we see that every knee is going to bow. Now now they're going to bow to this, of things in heaven. I think that's an interesting, uh, interesting point, not just the person of God, but things in heaven. You know, I, I, they're going to acknowledge that every word of that book is truth. And so the, the almighty God of heaven and the triune God as he sits on the throne, they're going to say, yeah, that's true. <laughs> All the beautiful golden streets and the amazing things that uh, John the apostle wrote of, they're going to say, he was right on. That all the things of heaven that they deny, they're going to say, yeah, that's right. That, that is certainly the, uh, the absolute truth. Now, now notice the next, the next statement, because I find it very interesting. And things in earth. Now, I was reading something today. I can't remember what it was. It's on the internet at work. I Googled something. Oh, I know what it was. It was, it was about the uh, Cumberland Gap and the Cumberland Mountains. We just went through there, and that's why it intrigued me. And, uh, of course, the description began like this. Three million trillion years ago. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I don't know who wrote that. I just thought it was stupid and got down to the early 1880s, the part I wanted to read. And, you know, whoever wrote that is going to say, I was wrong. The earth is only 6,000 years old. I was wrong. There was a great flood one time. I was wrong. <laughs> God did create every living thing on this planet. I was wrong about all they thought they understood about this earth. Can you imagine that day? Can you imagine when they have to acknowledge that the story of biblical creation right here is right on point? What a wonderful, glorious day that will be. So they'll acknowledge God's idea, God's truth concerning this created earth instead of their own things. The last, uh, last sentence, very, or last phrase, very interesting. And things under the earth. What's under the earth? Hell. Hell. They're going to say, yeah, it is a real place. Uh the most vile sinner you can think of. And uh, I'm going to stand up and say, it's as, it's as hot as that book says it is because I just came out of there. Can you imagine? They're going to acknowledge the reality of hell because they've been there. And, and they're going to understand the reality of the, and the misery, and you think about the rich man tonight, he is still there, and when he comes out for his individual judgment, he's going to acknowledge, yes, there's a hell down there. I didn't think there was, but certainly there is, and acknowledge the truth of this book. All that will occur because God is far above them. He's far above the understanding of mankind. Verse 11, and that every tongue shall, should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. So they're going to say, yes, Jesus is the Christ to glorify Jehovah. Every one of them. What a magnificent thing. He is above us. When you see things going around, don't be upset. One day, that can you imagine the day whatever ungodly set of judges approved Roe versus Wade? And he says, uh, I'm assuming it was our Supreme Court the way that I understand that. And there are nine there are nine chief judges. And one by one saying, He's God. He's God. He's God. He's God. And then them sadly looking upon him and say, I don't even know you. Depart from me, you workers of iniquity. See, that's a glorious, that's all above our understanding, isn't it? That's all. 
That, that, that is so much who our God is. He is above everything that's occurring down here. So the next time President Biden does something that you don't consider is the smartest thing that's ever done, been done, listen, God, God's above that. He is up there and under. He's creating it all. James. No. James chapter 1 and verse 16. James chapter 1 and uh, verse 16. Do not err, my beloved brethren. <clears throat> now, for him to caution them not to err, there's a possibility that we can be in error, right? We can be wrong. We can be uh, not in line with what the Bible teaches. So he, he says uh, very, very clearly, do not err, my beloved brethren, Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above. Uh, ladies, Sarah and Donna, you know why you can play so well? It's from above. You know, Adam, why your computer knowledge is, is, is where it's at, even though You've only had a week of college courses about it. It's from above. Mm -hmm. That's a gift, and it comes from above. And so we find another thing that should we should acknowledge that impacts our life every day is it's from above. How can a, a shy boy from... Uh, Donna calls it the armpit of America. Preach the gospel. It's above, it's from above. I can't do it. But the Lord can do it through me. And so we find, uh, as James is writing this letter, he says, you remember, you understand, don't get the erroneous idea that it's inside you. It comes from above. Everything that you're given comes from here. Do not err, my beloved brethren. Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above and cometh down from the Father of lights, with whom is no variableness, neither the shadow, neither shadow of turning. In other words, he will never leave us. Of his own will begat he us with the word of truth that we should be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. Now I want you to see, he says it very, very clearly, of his own will, beget us with the word of truth. So that's why we still preach tonight. I understand God's sovereignty more all the time, but he sent the church to preach. And I really believe this, without preaching there is no salvation. <coughs> None whatsoever. And so it must be done just like that. Don't, don't, don't err. And whatever gift you have, use it or lose it. And I most assuredly can tell you that is true. 100% true. And so we find as the Lord's people, we need to not only look for the gift and use that gift, but protect that gift because it cometh from the Father and he give it a specific, specifically for you to use for his glory. Last place, James chapter 3 and verse 14. We'll see the last thing that comes from above. Uh, James chapter 3, verse 14, the Bible says, But if ye have bitter envying, in strife in your heart, glory not, and lie not against the truth. You ever seen any dis dissension in a church? Every one of us has, whether it was uh, uh, in different places. But I believe we have a diversity in the group to say it happens all the time. I heard of a church today in a, in a very similar situation. And he says, if you have bitter Indian, you know, um, I believe all church dissension starts this way. I know 
the right way it's done. Well, you may think you do, but seek and pray. Because you know what? The Lord's brought me a long way over the years, and I think now maybe after 27 years of preaching, I know how stupid I was when I started. <laughs> you, know, you know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. and, and, and so we see then that we as the Lord's people need to understand that certainly we haven't arrived and when that dissension is created it's usually by someone who really doesn't know the truth. Verse 15, this wisdom descendeth not from above. So we find one thing that doesn't come down is these things that create dissension in the group. Dissension in the group. So if they don't come from above, they're either here or they come from up. And I think it could be either way. This, this earth is cursed, people. And, and, and you, you, you know what? I used to say, well, it has to be a lost person somewhere in there causing trouble. That's not true. Saved, redeemed people, I've seen them act w worse or worse-er than the redeemed. I mean, than the lost. I, I've met a lot of lost people that were very likable people. Very, very nice to talk to. And I've seen redeemed people say some of the most mean, ungodly things that you possibly could think of. Mm -hmm. That ought not to be named among God's people. So that, that that hellish attitude that I know I'm right and I know everything the Bible teaches, listen, dear friend, it does not come from above. <laughs> and <laughs> James makes that uh, very clear. This wisdom descendeth not from above, but it's earthly, sensual, and devilish. That's not a very good combination. Sensual means the flesh is in control. For where envying and strife is, there is confusion in every evil work. Um, envying, what I have found, it doesn't have to be the size of the church or how nice the building is. I've seen people get envious, and I'm talking about men of God preaching men of God. Two ways. One, envious over just the atmosphere and the sweetness of the fellowship of God's people, so they got to pick you apart and find something wrong. Mm -hmm. Or, worse than that, jealous of the man of God that's pa pastoring a happy church and tear him apart. Mm -hmm. I've seen that among God's people. And, and so we find here that it's as James is writing, he says, listen, that's not a godly spirit. That don't come from the above. It comes from below. Verse 17, but the wisdom that is from above, the one that comes from God, the one that comes from the Almighty, but the wisdom that is from above is first pure. That means sinless. That, that means without confrontation. That, that means pure. So any other wisdom, remember, it says it's earthly. It's from here. It's from where we presently live. So it has to be pure, this wisdom from that's above, then peaceable. Does it create peace or does it create strife? Gentle. Is it confrontational or is it presented with the spirit of love? And good fruits, and you can go to uh, Galatians chapter 5 and find out what those are without partiality. In other words, you don't, you don't um, make one man any different than the other. If they preach truth, you, you respect them. If they preach truth, you uh, you let them know about it. And, and he says those are the difference. They preach the gospel without respect of person. Lastly, and without hypocrisy. So is the man of God doing and saying? Or is he saying only? If he's saying only, then it's hypocrisy. And so we find 
as the Lord's people, we need to look for things that come from up there and not from what's around you. We need to we need to look to this book much, much more than we need to look at commentaries. Right. We need to look to this book uh, above anybody else's opinion that's out there. And listen, dear friend, if you can find it in this book, you'll be all right. The Lord will be well pleased. And that's where we ought to be.